This is Dateline News and Conversation. The topic tonight, Sweden. What is going on in Sweden politically and with NATO? My guest is a fearless peace fighter. She is tenacious. She is persistent. She's also a member of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And she has hosted an annual meeting of the Global Network in Sweden. We will learn all about this and more in tonight's show. Agneta, so good to see you. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so first of all, what is going on in Sweden politically? You And I want you to talk about your prime minister and tell me about these people. Are they Western-leaning, liberal, progressive, under the influence of the United States, or what is it about them? Well, I was a little bit surprised that you invoked uh, uh, progressive. <laughs> I mean, we have a right-wing government supported by the, how should I say, the racist, <clears throat> more or less, uh, Sweden Democrats who are calling the shots, actually. <clears throat> and uh, what can I say about Sweden? I think, in a way, we are moved back to the 30s in a kind of a dark, very gloomy, how should I say, atmosphere politically. Why do I say that? Because the alternative could be a social democratic government but both these kind of political arms are pro-NATO. So why we in Sweden have very little choice in a way. Of course, I would like to get rid of these, or should I say, pack <laughs> next election. But if the Social Democrats don't change, their pro-NATO posture. I'm not sure it's much of an alternative. We have, of course, the left party, and they have said that we are against Sweden joining NATO. But I don't see that much of agitation and actions from them. So we are in a shadow. Sweden is in a sort of a shadow and then the US and NATO are very happy to gradually grab us and bring us into NATO, which they will. Uh, interesting enough, we got sort of help from Turkey, Erdogan, who, which, who says, well, uh, I have some conditions if, you, if Sweden will join NATO. So is um, Hungary. They have also some conditions. They are not pleased with Sweden in NATO. It's, it's sort of a, a very special situation because <clears throat> many people say, oh, Erdogan shouldn't win. We have seen in the election that he has obviously won now this election. And I am, I am um, content with that because the other side, they are supporting the U.S., and so doesn't Erdogan. He has a sort of a 
pro, he tried to be on both sides, pro-Russian and a little bit pro-NATO, but he actually he doesn't want to belong to NATO. So I say, but how can you say that, Agneta? Yes, but if uh, we don't obey, <coughs> because the conditions for Erdogan is that we send all the political refugees, the Kurdish uh, refugees, PKK, to Turkey. We don't have to do that. Why should we? We say, no, thank you. But no, thank you. We don't want to join NATO on, so, on such terms. So I'm a little bit surprised that there are so many who is angry with Erdogan. Because I say, well, we should be more angry with the U.S. Because they, this big imperialist state, wants badly to drag us into NATO. They have always, in fact, we are in fact in NATO because they have been here since 2006 with huge exercises in the north of Sweden. Huge exercises every year, spring and winter, cold response in winter, and then Arctic challenge exercise in late May and June, every second year. So, in effect, to be blunt, we are in a way trapped, but I don't think we should blame Erdogan, we can say we don't want to send any Kurdish refugees, thank you. We don't want to do that. And then we can see what will follow. So <laughs> there we are. And I think I'm a little bit lonely in this position. Most people don't see it that way. They are so angry with Erdogan, how can he do that? And I say, what well, we don't have to do that. We don't have to send them. So, that the conditions, there we are. So, Agneta, you mentioned that uh, NATO has been there and the U.S. has got to be involved too since 2006. But um, doesn't the United States have downlink listening satellite stations in Sweden? Yes, then you come to another arena where I have been in, uh, for many, many years uh, since I met Bruce Gagnon in 2002. I started to investigate how are we Bruce Gannon, he is the, global, the, the chair or so in the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And after meeting him, I started to think, what do we have? Do we have anything that, that could be involved in this? And I discovered that we have a lot. First of all, we have... The world's, listen, the world's biggest downloading station from satellites. That is S-Range. And also we have not far from Stockholm. And that NSA, National Security Agency, NSA, have very close contact with NSA in the US. Why do I know that? Because Edward Snowden told it. He gave a lecture in um, before he w came to Moscow. He gave a lecture in um, in the European Parliament and uh, revealed that Sweden is after US and Britain the world's third biggest 
a listening station. What are we doing that is so harmful? And, and so why the US wants to have this contact? Oh my God, when President Obama was here, it was very little written about what, we, what was he actually doing in Sweden. But we who found out that he was very, very interested in this, to connect with FRA, and what is it in English now, this um, uh, listening station is the third biggest in the world. And they wanted, what exactly did they want to have? They wanted us to listen in as we do the Russian military cables on the bottom of the Eastern Sea which goes into Sweden, so we can listen on those signals and contacts. Imagine how important this is for the U.S. to freely get this information about the Russian army. So they shook hands. I have a picture here when Obama and Carl Bildt were standing together for <clears throat> this agreement. That is another thing. And down in south of Gothenburg, we have about the same as, as in, um, now we come to men with hill. Because in, in south of Gothenburg, 90 kilometers south of Gothenburg, you have Lier, Schiel. It's also an important listening station, which transform what they have to NSA. And uh, it, it, NSA is in, uh, <clears throat> in the U.S., so there we are in Sweden, beside what I started with, that we have since 2006 had all these military exercises, uh, cold response with 16,300 troops and air and land and sea. It's in the northern Sweden into Norway. Why did we know that? Because this is very secret. You don't, you, mag, newspapers don't write about it. But it was revealed in 2012 when a cargo plane flew into the mountain of Kepnekaise and three, no, five Norwegian youngsters died. So then it came to media knowledge. Otherwise, it's extremely silent. But <laughs> uh, this Arctic challenge exercise, which goes from Norway over Sweden to Rovaniemi and to the Russian border, a huge air wing uh, exercise, Arctic challenge exercise. And they are also AVAX. What is AVAX? Airborne warning and control stations. It's uh, huge B-52 bomb planes rebuilt with a radar on the top so they can fly very close to Russia and control the, and almost the entire Russian continent with their planes, uh, AVAX, Airborne Warning and Control Station. So there we are. Uh, so when we talk about Sweden joining NATO, it's not, it's not new. It has been ongoing for years. And, you know, I'm so old, so I remember how, um, how should I say, uh, the, the pro-U.S. sentiment should be implemented among us all. We all know 
the horrifying suffering by the Soviet Union, which by the Red Army, almost single-handed, defeated the Nazis with horrifying losses. 27 million died and 15 big cities were destroyed. And more, 70,000 villages burnt to the ground and among other things. So what had been natural in Sweden after 1945, it would have been, it would have been uh, informing us all about the suffering the Soviet Union had done to save us all from Nazism. Did they do that? No, instead it was sort of a deafening silence about it. That what I had, I was 15 years old, about, I was a teenager. No, I was eight years old when the war was over, so I'm very old. Um, and I, I can't remember that, but I know afterwards that I saw pictures because the US soldiers landed in Normandy to save us from Nazis. And nothing was, very little was told about. And they lost, I think, four or five hundred thousand. It's terrible. It's a terrible loss, of course. But 27 million people was sort of just mm, nothing. It wasn't, I wasn't brought up by that. I was brought up by uh, the, the US saved us all from Nazis. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And later on, I understood this and I got furious. I got furious. So the one you see here sitting in front of you is a furious woman that got furious in 1970. When I went to Leningrad, I had never heard about all the sufferings. But coming to Leningrad, it was, I, I, I can't explain how furious I was. They can silence about this. Then I thought, and I still think, what else can they silence if they silence this 27 million people afterwards it has come through but there during the after the war or 10 it was at rather soon the new the cold war what was there what was the mccarthy mccarthy in the u.s mccarthy in the u.s he started the cold war the russians are coming the russians are coming and you know the media as always were followed this and you know i was so i was 15 1952 i was so afraid i remember i cried because <sighs> But after visiting Leningrad, I was 30 years old, 31, and understood the horrifying lie I was exposed to. I have never cried, not once, only been fighting. That's that's me, Agneta. Um, I I've known you for some time now, and I know how strongly you feel about all of this. It's obvious, and how you are expressing yourself. I want to know now: Is Sweden sending money and weapons to Ukraine? Well, even the left party sent, I don't know what it is in English, grenade, panzer, bullets, something, ammunition. And even the left party agreed to sending this. Can you imagine we are now in a society 
where all political parties agree on supporting Nazis in Ukraine. The media is, of course, the culprit because they have never, ever mentioned that there was a coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2014, in February, I think. And the US, Victoria Nuland, Senator, no, she wasn't, Senator McCain was there. And uh, Victoria Nuland, she was, uh, what is it, State Department something, I don't remember. So they were there because there were demonstrations in Ukraine and um, it also have come uh, have been revealed that there were Nazis standing on the roof shooting people uh, making panic and ang and uh, people were panicking and very frightened what's going on here and all the shooting i think they shot 40 41 no i know uh, not the figure i'm not sure but many they shot and now it is revealed that it was the nazis or the neo-nazis that had the swaboda uh, is called uh, swaboda part, and also right sector it's also kind of a nazi party they shot people and created panic. So uh, people just, it was rather easy to create a situation where they were angry with Viktor Yanukovych. He had done it. And this Viktor Yanukovych, he had been elected uh, was it prime minister or president? Uh, Osse had uh, supervised and, and, and watched. So it was quite okay. He was the elected leader in Ukraine. But people started to... Uh, he got so um, harassed and they, they, they blamed him for everything that was wrong so he had to leave and leave for his life they wanted to kill him and now they has come forward that it was all these pro neo-nazis that was behind this so this um victor yanukovych he fled i think he, he fled first to donbass and after that he fled to Moscow. The new government first, the neo-Nazi first law. And then Victoria Nuland was very uh, happy to, I want Yats, Arseny Yatsenyuk was her favorite. So they were discussing who should rule Ukraine after the coup d'etat, after Viktor Yanukovych had been chased away. So it was sort of a real criminal act, actually. It was not an election or something. It was, they just put him, Arseny Yatsenyuk, and then I forgot the president. Well, and he was from right sector. What happened in Donbass? in eastern Ukraine. They were furious. They didn't want to be ruled by a Nazi. They made demonstrations. They were terrible, upset, because one of the first laws, this <laughs> Arsene Yatsenyuk, or what is the president's name? I don't remember. They said, Russia, by law, is not allowed to be spoken and used 
as a language, official language in Ukraine. <laughs> and when you know the whole Eastern Ukraine speak Russian, it's a Russian, it's a Russian speaking. Most of the people, I met one from Ukraine the other day because many refugees has come here. And he said, we mostly spoke, I asked him, <laughs> he said, oh, oh yeah, we spoke Russian, Mo most of us speak Russian. So it was really a horrifying thing. And they protested and they were absolutely upset and wanted, they, they wanted to declare themselves independent. Donetsk and uh, Luhansk and, and I don't know, but they, those two were the biggest. What did then Kiev do? They sent in the Azo Battalion, which are Nazis. And what did they do? They killed 14,000 people, among them also children. This was going on, and they asked Russia for help in Donetsk. Um, in Donbass. Help us! Help us! They are killing us! They are murdering us! But President Putin, he suggested some peace talk. So there Minsk comes in. He suggested that, that um, <clears throat> we must sit down and discuss peacefully and they did in 2014 it was a declaration minsk one and in 2015 there was minsk two and it's on the web if you look up minsk agreement everything comes up it's not a secret everything they decided and interesting enough um Germans, Angela Merkel, and uh, France, what was his name, Hollande, uh, were around and to see to that this was in order. And so it was decided. But one thing is that <laughs> you remember President Obama. He was the president by that time, time if I'm not disinformed. <laughs> he got the Nobel Peace Prize. And if you see what happened during President Obama's presidency, I think it was seven wars among them this was happened in ukraine and i think it was in africa and other places he got the nobel peace prize it's sh shameful to say the least so what happened then in ukraine eight years of suffering, of war, of civil war. And eventually the Russians went in after many, many cry for help from Donetsk and Lugansk and all these places. And they went in 24th of February 2022 for um, denazification and demilitarization and it ha it is still ongoing and what has the west done it's so shameful they have sent arms 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 for billions, there we are. But I could see this today, 
that there has been an yes this today i saw on tv that there is a, a big advertisement in new york times asking for peace and they are i think i'm not sure but they are military they are officers they 15 i think has signed a huge advertis uh, in in new york times to stop this war and there we are <laughs> i don't know whether i said something that you wonder and want to continue with no agneta i want to thank you for that testimony it's important i think for people to understand how people not only in russia but around the world including in a place like sweden that as you said is not formerly a NATO country yet, but will be, but for many years have actually been working with the United States and NATO in, in Sweden. Now, I want to ask you this. You have become, in your lifetime, a very informed and radical peace activists. Tell me about your work and the experience you've had in Sweden, especially of late, when you have been alienated. <laughs> I, excuse me, I'm laughing because it's the only way I can take it. <laughs> because one year ago, or a little bit more, I said something I really don't regret it, but, but it was sort of stupid. I didn't know my enemy. I said on Facebook, I think it was about this time for one year. No, it was in March. I said, I hope the Russians will stay in Ukraine till they have chased out the Nazis, that's what I said on Facebook. Do, 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 do. Imagine my surprise when expressing a sort of a dirty uh, daily, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's a call to a built item or something like that, or whatever, the sun or the sun maybe mm, in comparison. They put it up and said, look what Agneta Norberg has said. Agneta Norberg wants the Russian to stay in Ukraine till they have chased out the Nazis. And imagine my surprise. But it, this shows the media's role because Swedish Women's Left Association, which I had belonged to since, I think, 70, 1973 something, a long time. They just said goodbye to me. You were not, you can't be a member of our organization. They didn't tell me why, but they said, and they didn't last long until I mean, I was in the left party. I've left it now because they didn't support me. They didn't defend me. I was left or in, I was in the church congregation. And this church, they have a leftist branch. And they said, you are not welcome here in leftist left in the Swedish church. Now, it, yeah, it is supposed to the organization. So there, they excluded me. <laughs> and then, that was one thing. Uh, and I, I felt a little bit, oh my God, what have I done? But anyhow, it didn't last long until there were others, Facebook, I think I have a record. I have been stopped 
for writing in Facebook seven times. I'm not allowed to write. And, and 29 days each. Uh, now, with less time, I will see if I am allowed again. Um, well, that shows what Facebook is. And I think I have a record there to be excluded. You are not allowed to write in Facebook. Mm -hmm. Seven times. So, and now I was invited as a speaker. Women for Peace wanted to organize a conference in the north of Sweden. Jokmok. It's very up in the north. And I was invited to talk about what I know, about S-Range, about space, uh, how, how Sweden is involved in space war, and so on. That, that was the subject they wanted me to talk about. But it didn't last long. And they, this happened in, I think, as early as February. To be sure, I had the possibility to to be there, they invited me very early. But they have also some other organization co-sponsoring the conference. And two organizations, I think it was something Naturskyddsföreningen, Naturvård Association, and some environmental organization, they said, if Agneta Norberg is allowed to speak at this conference, we will not support this conference economically. So there we are. And I can see as well in Sweden how it has these horrifying things going on in Ukraine, together with the media lying, um, horrifying media actually they have created a climate that the peace movement or organizations are also divided so there we are but I have I am happy to be in women for peace they have not taken this decision so there I can dwell and even in Swedish the Peace Council. There I can be, and Swedish Peace Committee. But in others, it's it's really it's really sorry to say the least the the political climate when it comes to Russia and uh, Ukraine. So. Uh, being knowledgeable, it's important. Otherwise, I would have been very sad. Of course, I am a little sad, but I know the conditions. I can see through it. I can see the danger of media's role. Actually, I must blame media for creating this. And it has also not only divided the peace organization, it has divided families. I have friends that can't talk with their sons. I have friends that they can't... I mean, it has gone into the family. And globally, I can see rather encouraging picture growing. It's, it is the China, Russia, and to a certain extent India, uh, Africa, and even Latin America have the same attitude towards Russia. Because specifically, I saw a picture that was very moving. I saw a picture from an African, I think it was from Congo. There was a demonstration 
It's a rather small demonstration, but anyhow, they kept a huge photo of President Putin. It has become a situation when they are not forced to obey the only superpower which have ruled too long. We are witnessing a new power structure, which is for me very encouraging. But I regret that Sweden is not in, as I can see, the right sector. They are aligning themselves with one of the most murderous power in the world, namely the United States of America. And it is very regretful. I regret that, but I can see that this is, if you go to the murder of our Prime Minister Olof Palme, it is now about 40 years since he was murdered. And it was, in my understanding, a CIA work. We have since then gradually, gradually develop, developed a very bad policy. So Sweden is not the country it used to be. As I said once, when I went to the United Nations, I met a woman in a couple of years ago, and she said, oh, I said, I come from Sweden. Oh, Sweden, I said, forget it. Forget it. Sweden is not the country you should um, be fond of. We have changed 180 degrees, sad to say. So we have a strong political work ahead if we survive in these horrifying times. Wow, Agneta, thank you for that. Um, you know, I share your feeling. I, uh, I do not recognize the country of my birth, the United States of America, I do not recognize it now. It is nothing like what I knew when I was growing up in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, and I think people around the world uh, who are not young, but maybe middle-aged or a little older, are feeling the same things. I think mm -hmm. the world has changed radically, uh, as you have noted. And... I would say it's because of the influence of the sole imperial uh, empire, the United States. Now, I want to ask you one last question. Are you going to give up or are you continuing to fight like you have <laughs> for so many years? Tell me you're not going to quit. No, you can't do that. I mean, how can you quit? You can't. It, it, it's my life. I can't just step out from my life. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. I'm, I'm glad that I have, uh, I was born in a way with these, how should I say, optimistic. I, I'm like my mother. She had seven kids and she was a teacher in this a little village and um, she always kept going in a way and my father said I can't understand Hulda my mother's name was Hulda I can't understand do you you have no problems the world isn't what you think it's rather difficult what how can you laugh and be so so glad <laughs> what could she say? I mean, she saw 
She knew very well that it was difficult, but she had the mindset that she did not, she, she worked hard, but she didn't put the black things inside her to put her down. And, and so am I. It doesn't come into my heart. I, I, when I go to sleep in the evening, I sleep well. I open in the morning, I stand up and, t and think, I say, what can I do? Now I have to, you know, I'm always ready to do something. And, and, and it's an heritage, it's, it's, some, it's a bringing up and I can't help it. And I, the alternative, I mean, it's death. I mean, you die before you die, and I, I'm not, I don't think I will do that. I will live till I die and do whatever I can. That's me. Well, Agneta, <laughs> you have been an inspiration to many people around the world because you have traveled extensively into the United States several times to Russia, and I have to tell you, you've been an inspiration to me. And um, as you mentioned, to quit is to die. And we ain't ready to die yet. Agneta, I want to thank you again for being a guest on my show and for sharing with me and this audience what is actually and really happening in Sweden. Thank you very much. And let's continue in the fight.